Okay, good morning. I have an announcement. Um, first, uh, fast imaging, you know, the people who sell those slides that uh, we're using for lecture, they said if anyone still wants to buy one, please call in advance because they've run out of them all and they'll make you a special group. But if you just show up there, they won't have them there available for you. So if you want to still, if you haven't bought the slides yet and still want to, call Fast Imaging before you go and tell them you want it. And they'll have it ready for you. Okay? Um, today we're going to talk about monetary gains and losses. This actually goes down below the demand and supply curves, peeling off more layers on top to get at more of what's the essence underneath. Um, this is extremely important. For most policies that we enact, we'd like to know whether they benefit society. And one of the ways to do this is to count up the benefits in monetary terms of the policy, and then also count up the cost to society of the policy. And if the benefits exceed the costs, then we think, yes, that's a good policy. Let's go ahead and do it. If the benefits are less than the cost, then we shouldn't do it from a social perspective. So it's a very useful um, uh, rubric for determining whether to engage in a policy. For example, whether to rebuild the Bay Bridge after the earthquake. Um, building the Bay Bridge is an extremely expensive operation, and we want to counter that against the benefits of having the bridge that wouldn't collapse in the next earthquake and measure those benefits. Um, that's a relatively physical one, but a lot of times there are policies that are simply manipulations in price or changes in the way markets work. For example, when airlines were deregulated many years ago, there was a big issue about whether we should allow um, the continuation of regulation of uh, airline prices or we should allow them to be determined by a market system. And there, the um, issue was, what are the gains to be obtained from allowing the market system to work? And what are the losses from um, losing the protections that the regulation provides? So we wanted to measure both the gains and losses. Um, one of my old buddies, uh, Cliff Winston, examined this after the fact, not before the fact, and found that the gains w greatly exceeded the losses. But um, this is a, a basic way for determining for yourself and for us as a society whether we want to engage in a particular policy. So the question is, how do we measure these monetary gains and losses? And to do that, we go underneath the demand and supply curves. So let's first look at the demand curve. Um, the demand curve for the market, which is what we've been discussing so far, is made up of demand curves for each individual person. Each person at a given price is going to buy a certain amount of the good. You add that up over all the people in the, in the um, economy, and that's the overall the, um, market demand for the good. So to be able to understand market demand, we need to understand consumer demand. So now let's look at one individual person and what motivates their own demand curve, what determines that person's choice process for um, that, uh, that uh, underlies their demand curve. And to do that, we're going to utilize a concept called marginal willingness to pay. Um, for a particular good, you have an amount that you're willing to pay for the good, for, an, for one unit of the good. Like if you're buying blue jeans, uh, how much are, is it worth to you to have a pair of blue jeans? That's the maximum you'd be willing to pay. So willingness to pay is a relatively straightforward concept that you can think of. It's a negotiation-free maximum amount that you're willing to pay. So it's not like you say you're willing to pay $8, but you're really willing to pay 10 because you're hoping to get it for 9 or something like that. It's truly, if you were forced to pay this price, what is the maximum price you, were, you would pay? Anything beyond that, you just walk away. Okay. So that's what willingness to pay is. It's the maximum amount you're willing to pay. Marginal is a term that we will use constantly in this course. Uh, it's one of the most important contributions of economics to society in general, the idea of looking at things on the margin. So what does marginal mean? Marginal means as you increase one thing, how much does something else change? In the current context, if you are consuming a certain amount of a good, you ask the question, how much am I willing to pay for one extra unit? Okay. 
that's your marginal willingness to pay. That's your willingness to pay for one extra unit given whatever you're consuming. So for example, blue jeans, if you've already got one pair of blue jeans, how much are you willing to pay for your second pair? And then if you've got two pairs, how much are you willing to pay for your third pair? That's the marginal willingness to pay. It's not your total willingness to pay for all the blue jeans that you want. It's the amount that you're willing to pay for one extra given what you've already got. And as we'll see throughout this course, decisions are made by examining things on the margin. What has already brought us to a certain point, where should we go from here? Should we move forward or go back? And that depends on what are the valuations at the margin for one extra good or one less good. Okay? So I'm going to use a running example here that um, uh, when I was going over this yesterday, it, it seemed a little hokey, but you'll get the idea. Suppose you had to pay for long distance calls. This is good because most of you don't pay for long distance calls. You've got free messaging plans. But still, there is the hypothetical question of if you had to pay for it, what is the maximum you'd be willing to pay? And we will want to look at a person's demand over a period of time, so let's say a month. If you could only make one call in a month, and so the first question is, if you don't make any calls and you're deciding how much you're willing to pay for one call, and you can only make one call during the month, how much are you willing to pay for it? Well, it's probably a considerable amount because you, you know, if you're only going to make one call a month, you're probably going to want to make it to someone that's really important to you or you really want to convey a lot of information to. You might be calling your parents or your partner or something and it's really important to connect with them and talk to them. So you're willing to pay maybe $8. Obviously, you're not going to have to pay that, at least in the real world we live in. But as a hypothetical situation, if you were required to pay it, you would pay $8 to make one call a month to the person that you think is most important for you to talk to. Then given that you've made one call, how much would you be willing to pay for making a second call, one extra? And it's going to be less. Because, obviously, if you made one call, you made it to the most important person to talk to. And then the next one, by definition, is less valuable. In fact, if it was more valuable to call that second person, you would have called them first. Okay? So the value for that second call is going to be less than the first one. And then you go for the third call, it goes down, da-da-da-da-da, and it keeps on going like this. Okay? So what you have is the marginal willingness to pay is the willingness to pay that if you were forced to pay it, how much is the maximum you'd be willing to pay for one extra good given what you're already consuming? Okay. Um, as I've drawn that, as I've given the numbers, um, that gives they decrease as the quantity that you're consuming increases. Okay. And that is codified by the law of diminishing marginal willingness to pay. This is true for practically all goods. When there's a law in economics, it means nearly always the type. We live here in Berkeley, know you can break laws. So, um, you know, uh, it doesn't always occur, but it practically always does. And it's easiest to think of it as always occurring. Okay? Um, and mainly, it's just saying that if, as you get more and more of something, an extra unit is less valuable. Your per first pair of jeans, you got to have a pair of jeans. And so you're willing to pay a lot for that. Your second one, you're less willing to pay for. Third one, you're even less willing to pay because you might need something else. Um, and so it's a general characteristic of goods. Now, if we graph it, let's graph it with quantity in this direction, okay, on the horizontal axis, price on the, uh, or willingness to pay on the vertical axis. And each of these points is just one of the um, uh, numbers that I had in the previous chart. So all I'm doing is giving that chart. If you have one, um, the, your first unit that you consume, your willingness to pay for that is eight. The second unit, given that you've got one already, you're only willing to pay six, and you continue on down. Well, as you can imagine, if we would combine all those points and all the points in between them, and that is our marginal willingness to pay curve. How do you get a point in between one and two? You either, if you want to stay as a purist in theory, you stay with a graph like this that doesn't have anything between one and two. You'll get the same results we're getting today with the continuous curve, which is easier to think about with continuous. Or the other way to think about it is that what the quantity is here is actually an average. 
So you can have something between one and two, you can have one and a half, which means you make on average one and a half calls a month. One month you'll make one call, the next month you make two, that averages to one and a half. So the fractions in between represent a flow concept, an average over, over a period of time. So you can look at it in either of those two ways, whichever one you find more helpful for your analysis in a particular situation. Okay. Did you hear me say okay? I watched the video of myself yesterday, of the last lecture, and I say okay all the time. <laughs> I'm gonna have to stop that. So, so holler out, no okay, every time I say it or something like that. You're, how many of you have seen South Park with that stupid teacher that says, okay, okay, <laughs> you know? It looked like me. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea. Anyway, that's one advantage of these videos. You get to get a little feedback. <laughs> um, <laughs> the point I want to make next is... <laughs> that the marginal willingness to pay curve is, lo and behold, the demand curve for a person. The reason we went through this analysis is because it actually motivates the demand curve for an individual person. So now I want to convince you that this marginal willingness to pay curve that we obtained by asking those hypothetical questions, what's the maximum you'd be willing to pay, is actually the same as the person's demand curve. The demand curve tells you at any price how much is the person willing to buy at that price. So let's suppose, just as an example, that the person was facing a price of $3. What if the price were $3? How much would this person decide to buy? Well, they would step through it. They'd say, okay, well, do I want to buy one unit? And the answer is yes, I'm willing to pay $8, and yet I only have to pay 3 and so I'm willing to pay more than the price, and so I'll buy it. Do I want to buy two units? And the answer is yes. I'm willing to pay six, da da da. Three, four, my willingness to pay is exactly three dollars. Given that that's my willingness to pay, I buy it, okay? Um, and buy four units. But then after that, I don't buy the fifth one because my fifth, for the fifth unit, the willingness to pay is less than the price. So if you read from the price over to the marginal willingness to pay curve, where that price line intersects the marginal willingness to pay curve, that tells you the quantity that the person's going to demand at that price. Any quantity less than this, their willingness to pay is greater than the price, and any quantity that's more than that, their willingness to pay is less than the price, and so they don't buy it. Okay? That's why we want to look at marginal willingness to pay. It gives us the demand curve. And as we'll see, it gives us a way of reading new information from the demand curve that is vital for determining costs and benefits. So the demand curve is the marginal willingness to pay curve. They're not two separate concepts. They're two ways of looking at exactly the same information. Um, and so you can read the demand curve by the traditional way that we had first, which is at a given price, how much will a person buy? That's starting in the y-axis reading over to the x. Or at any quantity, what is the person's marginal willingness to pay? Now, let me go back to this. How many of you remember from your math classes that when you define a function, the traditional way to describe it is this is the, if it's y as a function of x, you put x here and the function of x going up this direction, right? Yeah. Well, when we originally defined our demand curves, we did it the opposite way. We let the variable that was varying here and then read over instead of up. That was backwards of normal math. This explains why we did it. The way you look at the demand curve and the way we originally drew it is actually not the most fundamental way of looking at a demand curve. A demand curve is more fundamentally seen as at any given quantity that the person's consuming, what is their willingness to pay on the margin? What's their marginal willingness to pay? And that just happens to be, it's also their demand curve, read in the other direction. So this now makes our demand curve, which is our marginal willingness to pay curve, consistent with the way normally mathematics is done, where you put the thing that you're varying down here and read up to the value of the function. Okay? 
And we'll see that that makes it actually much more useful and more consistent with all other forms of, of, of um, uh, variational analysis that we do within this class. That we're actually, the consumer, we're walking them through the decision of how many units to buy and varying this, comparing their marginal willingness to pay to price at every step. And that's the way we figure out how much they're going to buy. Okay. <coughs> Now, the uh, fact that the marginal willingness to pay curve and the demand curve are one and the same provides us some information about um, the value to the customer of consuming in this market. Essentially, for all units that the consumer buys, the consumer is willing to pay at least the price or else he or she wouldn't buy them, right? So we can walk through and find out for each unit what's going on and how much the person's willing to pay compared to what they have to pay and what they get as a kind of bonus, right? So for the first call, they're willing to, this person's willing to pay $8 for that call. If the price is $1.50, let's suppose, suppose the price is $1.50, then they're actually getting a surplus. They're getting a benefit from buying that call in excess of what they actually have to pay the difference between what their maximum willingness to pay is and what they actually have to pay. This is the amount of other goods and services that they would willingly give up to make an extra phone call, but they only have to give up this amount. And so this is, in a sense, the excess value that they get from making the call. They get more value from that call in terms of goods and services that they'd be willing to give up if they had to than they have to. So they're getting this benefit. This is a benefit or surplus, as we call it. Um, for the second call, the person's willing to pay $6, only has to pay $1.50, and so ends up with $4.50 as willingness to pay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, as surplus. $4.50 minus $1.50 is 3 And it continues on down until the very last unit, you're not willing to pay y um, any more than the price, and so there's a, price, a surplus of 0 okay. If you add these up, that's the total benefit that the person gets from consuming the good in the market. It's $16 in this case, the sum of all these surpluses. Okay. The, um, the um, benefit that the person obtains is not the sum of their willingness to pay. That's how much they're willing to pay, but they do have to pay something. So you could think of the total benefit is the sum of the willingness to pay minus the sum of what they actually have to pay gives you the total consumer surplus that they obtain in the market. This idea that consumers obtain surplus in a market it, through consumption is exceedingly important. I don't know how many times I get upset, you probably do too, that you think you're getting screwed. You know, you think you're paying too high of a price, that the supplier is unfair, you get exceedingly angry about it. You have to keep remembering, if you're buying the good, you're better off. You're getting a benefit. Who are you to complain? You're complaining because you wish you could have gotten a bigger benefit. But you don't want that ever to cloud the fact that you actually are getting a benefit. So for example, there was a, um, this wasn't the recent hurricane, but the uh, a couple of years ago, there was a hurricane in Florida, and they didn't have any potable water, and some people brought in water and sold it at astronomical prices. That was perhaps, you know, really bad. But the people who bought it benefited, even at those high prices, because it was worth it to them, or they wouldn't have bought it. The fact that you're buying the good evidences, or the fact that the consumer buys the good, evidences that the willingness to pay for it exceeds the price, and hence... The, there's a benefit from it. This is also important when you look at the difference between private markets and government intervention. Now, I don't want you to imply from my statement about this that I'm opposed to government intervention. We're going to spend lots of time in this class about how you should have government intervention in various ways. But one thing about a private market is you don't have to buy the good. You don't have to spend your money on it. And when the government taxes you, you're required to pay that money and then the government spends it on what it thinks maybe you want or should want or will want, but 
it might not be what you really want, okay? So for the, <laughs> so for the goods that the government buys, you do not have a guarantee that, the, um, that your willingness to pay exceeds how much you're having to pay for it. Whereas in a private market, it is by definition the case. If you didn't, I weren't willing to pay more and get some benefit from it, you wouldn't buy it. And if nobody was, those companies would go out of business. Now, there's a graphical way to show this consumer surplus. Um, and this becomes very important because I find graphical analysis really clarifies things a lot. Um, so this is not new information, it's just another way of charting the information we already have. Uh, what I want to prove to you is that the area underneath the demand curve and above the price is equal to the consumer surplus. The way to do this is, again, I want to just march it through one good at a time. The first good, the person's willing to pay $8, only has to pay $1.50, and so gets this gold area here as surplus of $6.50. The next unit, you get the next gold area, okay, which is $4.50. Next unit, you continue on up and you combine them all. Now what I did here was for individual units, and if you really do want to stick with your analysis that um, you can only make integer number of calls in a month, then that is your willingness to pay, and that will be equal to the $16 I gave. However, under a continuous demand curve where fractions are allowed and we're talking in a flow concept, it's an average over numerous months, you can get fractions. So what if we did exactly the same thing using halves instead of whole units? Well, we get that, but the sawtooth, notice that the sawtooth now has gotten finer and there's less of the little blue parts left. As you go from here to here, you're filling in more and then if you went to a quarter, you'd fill in even more. And if you went to an eighth, you'd be filling in even more. Eventually, for continuous changes, infinitesimally small changes, it's the entire area under the demand curve and above the price. That's the consumer surplus from consumption in that market. And notice, it can't be negative. There's no way you can draw the curve and have it be negative. It's either positive or zero. Now, in many cases, we want to see what is the effect on consumers, the monetary value of a change in the market, the change in price, say. You're going to put a tax on a good, you're going to do something else, and there's going to be a change, you're going to deregulate airlines, there's going to be change in prices. And so we want to know what is the change in consumer surplus as a result of the change in prices. Um, if we start out, what I want to convince you of is that it's this area here, between the two prices. And the way to think about it is, if you start out at a given price and you raise the price, then consumer surplus is the golden area here. You raise the price, you reduce consumer surplus, now it's the area above the new price, below the demand curve. And what's the difference between the two? We originally had this amount, now with a higher price we have that amount, and so the difference is this amount right here. The loss in consumer surplus from a change in the price, from an increase in the price. There. So if you increase the price from P1 to P2, the monetary value of the loss to consumer, the amount that they are hurt by that price increase in dollar terms, is given graphically as the area to the left of the demand curve between the two prices. It's important to remember directions in this case, uh, though it might be clear in your mind as soon as you start saying it, it can become confusing. The, the consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve and above price. But the change in consumer surplus, in this case the loss in consumer surplus as you raise the price, is the area to the left of the demand curve between the two prices. It's just well, how you talk about it. And obviously, if you lowered the price, it would be that if you went from P2, you started there and went down to P1, this would be the monetary value of the gain to consumers of dropping the price. Now, we can apply this. Remember we had our gas tax? Last 
lecture, we talked about the gas price, the gas tax raising the price of the good by 20 cents. And that we labeled as the consumer's burden. That is a burden that's denoted in cents per gallon. It's a 20 cent per gallon burden borne by the consumers. But it's not a dollar amount. It's not a how many millions of dollars do consumers lose as a result of that. It's not the quantity that we're actually interested in if we're wanting to do consumer surplus, uh, I'm sorry, benefits against costs. Um, but we now know how to do that. The um, amount that consumers lose, the monetary value of the loss to consumers from raising, from, from putting on this tax is this area right here, which now that I've got straight demand curves, a straight uh, demand curve, it's very easy to calculate. It's going to be, if you break it up into the two parts, this part is a rectangle, which is the change in price, 20 cents, times the quantity that's being consumed at the new price, which is 8 billion. Okay. That's this rectangle. And then you have the triangle here, which is, what's the area of a triangle? Height times width divided by 2. So the height is 0.2. The width here is the difference between 10 billion and 8 billion, so it's 2 billion, and then divide by 2. So the total loss to consumers is 16 billion plus um, 0.2 billion, 1.8 billion. So now we have a measure of how much this tax is hurting consumers. And we can compare that against other things that we'll talk about later um, that might be the benefits of the tax. Notice that the loss to consumers is made up of two parts. Yeah. This is, um, what did I say? This is billions, billions of barrels, let's say. <laughs> huh? So there is a tax of 50 cents placed on every barrel, and the total amount that people lose is 8 billion barrels times 20 cents each is 1.6 billion dollars, et cetera. Okay? Yeah. Uh, anything else? There's two parts of this consumer loss. Um, one is an actual expenditure of money. Consumers are now paying, instead of a dollar, they're paying a dollar 20. And so this area right here is the amount that they're actually paying in higher prices for their current consumption. They're currently consuming this amount after the tax is applied, and they're paying 20 cents more than they used to be paying. So that's what this is. So in a sense, that part of the loss is money that consumers are actually paying out. But there's also a loss that is not a transacted loss. It's not a loss that is going anywhere. It's just, in a sense, a loss compared to what could have been. That's because consumers are now consuming less than they used to be consuming at the new price and losing the benefits of that consumption. If the price were at its original level, they would consume this amount. When the price rises, consumers decide to forego some of that consumption. That consumption had some value to them. What is the value? It's given by their marginal willingness to pay. It's that amount here. And they're giving up that amount of value by consuming less. Okay. And the value of it is the area below the demand curve and above the price, this little triangle right here. So this is a transacted loss. This is a loss that comes from the fact that we're giving up consumption of something that had value to us it doesn't have enough value to pay the higher price, but it still had value that was higher than the old price and below the new price. We've got to account for it. The total area is the consumer loss of the surplus, yes. Uh, no. Actually, that's an interesting question. The question was, is that small yellow triangle the decreased marginal willingness to pay? 
And uh, the answer is no, but it's very close. It, but it raised an important point. Notice that the person's marginal willingness to pay at 10 billion is here. Consumers' willingness to pay is a dollar. They continue consuming until their marginal willingness to pay drops to a dollar, and then they quit consuming anymore. If you add the, if the price is now a dollar twenty, their now willingness to pay is a dollar twenty. They've quit consuming all the goods that were valued at less than a dollar twenty. So all this is actually represents an increase in the person's marginal willingness to pay. As you move from this point to this point, the person is consuming less, moving backwards on their willingness to pay curve to a higher marginal willingness to pay. What this is, is the loss in surplus from those units that the person has foregone. That's right. The more steep the demand curve, the smaller this triangle will be. And in fact, if the demand curve is totally um, uh, vertical, meaning that you're going to buy it no matter what the price is, then there is no area of triangle. There's still this area here because this represents the lost benefit from reducing consumption. And if it's a, uh, a vertical demand curve, there is no reduction in consumption. This is important to recognize, though, because it's often the case you think about how much does this tax hurt me. You think about how much am I consuming and how much is the tax higher, uh, the price higher because of the tax, and that's what it is. But you're leaving out this, and that could be, you know, over the economy, it can be a huge amount of money and make or break whether a policy is worthwhile. Now, supply curve. We're going to do essentially the same thing on the supply side, but instead of talking about benefits to the consumer, we're going to talk about cost to the supplier. It's the exact flip. Um, the buyers are buying things because it provides them benefits, and the question is how much are you willing to pay for those benefits? The supplier is supplying things that it costs them money to provide. Right. Um, now, on the supply side, the same thing goes. We've got the market supply curve, and um, every firm that is supplying in the market has its own supply curve of how much that firm would supply given the price for the good. And so the market supply curve is simply the sum, the aggregation of all these individual supply curves. So we want to look at each individual firm. We want to go below the market, look at the individual firms. To do that, we look at marginal cost. It's the flip of marginal willingness to pay. How much um, does it cost the firm to produce the good? So the cost is a concept you obviously understand. It's how much does it cost the firm to produce the good. Marginal is, given that you're already producing, given that the firm is already producing a certain quantity, how much does it cost to produce one more unit? So we're still talking about marginal changing in one unit. What's the change in cost associated with one extra unit? So suppose the firm is um, providing a million um, long-distance calls and asks the question, if I increase to a million plus one, how much would my cost go up? And the answer is, say, a dollar. Why does the firm's cost go up at all? It might be, actually, you will have situations you can examine where it won't go up at all. The marginal cost could be zero. The, per, the firm has built so much capacity that adding one extra call doesn't cost anything. But generally, there's going to be something that has to increase if you're going to provide one extra call. Back in the days where we put calls through wires, you have to um, make bigger wires and more aggregation of phones. And so to make one extra call after you've aggregated correctly for the million calls, you have to make it a little bigger. And for cell phones, it's even the case that making, uh, allowing more calls, the company has to buy more frequency to be able to allow it. And frequency is not cheap. Um, so generally, there's going to be a cost associated with providing one extra unit of the good. And then you can ask the same question. As the firm increases their units of production, at each point, what is the cost of making one extra call, of providing one extra call? So they've got two million, three million, I've written it so that there, it's increasing. It need not be, just as we don't have a law of upward sloping supply 
it mimics the downward sloping demand, it need not be increasing. But it usually is for most production processes, and there is a way in which you can argue that it always is eventually, that eventually marginal cost will rise as you produce more and more of the good. It might be so eventually that it's irrelevant to whatever you're analyzing, so that for the purposes of at hand, you might think marginal cost is flat. But eventually, we start running out of resources. There's something that is going to be a constraint on further production, and to be able to produce more and more, you run up against constraints and the costs get higher. For example, with frequency, you just run out of frequency. There's, there's gonna be some point. With wires, you run out of copper, or there gets to be a shortage of copper. And if nothing else, this always occurs with firms, the larger the firm gets, the more inefficient it is at producing things, because there's like layers of management, and so their costs rise simply from being too large. So eventually, I'm, I would argue that marginal cost always starts to rise eventually. Now, when it starts to rise can be very relevant, as we'll see, on whether a firm ends up, the market ends up being competitive, monopolistic, or whatever. But um, for today, I'm just going to let it go up, holding in abeyance the concept that it could be flat for a long ways. We chart these in the same way we charted the um, marginal willingness to pay, five uh, units on this quantity here and price in that direction. Combining all those gives us the marginal cost curve. And lo and behold, the marginal cost curve is the supply curve for the individual firm. Why? Suppose the price were $1.20. The firm could sell as much as it wanted to at a price of $1.20, no negotiation, that's what the price is. Um, what would the firm do? The firm would start out producing very little and say, okay, well, should I produce an extra unit? The answer is yes. The cost of producing an extra unit is less than I can sell it for, so I'll make a profit by the difference. And so yes, I should sell an extra unit. Then ask, well, how about another one after I've already done that one? And the firm just steps through the process, producing more and more units, until it gets to two million or whatever the units were here. At that point, the extra cost of one extra unit is actually equal to the price, and so the firm just breaks even, doesn't make any money on it, and let's just say he provides it, he or she provides it. After that, the firm does not go any further because if the firm went further, they'd be saying, oh, well, the marginal cost exceeds the price of the good. If I produce that extra unit, I'm going to be losing money on it, I'd be better off not producing it. So the firm will start out with a low level of output and continue on out until their output, um, their marginal cost is equal to the price. So you can look at this curve in either of two ways, in the same way you did the demand curve. The traditional supply curve concept is at a given price, what is the firm gonna supply? And in this case, it's gonna be two million units. Okay. Or you can look at it at a given quantity, what is the marginal cost of the firm to produce one extra unit? And those are two equivalent pieces of information that in different contexts can be different usefully. You'll actually have in your, in your um, uh, book, I think, situations where the s marginal cost curve goes down and then starts up. It could go down and then be flat for a long ways and then go up. All I'm arguing is that eventually it goes up. And the important thing about that, the, I think your book will have an area where it goes down and then starts up. When marginal cost is going down, you never need to consider that part of the demand curve, that, that part of the marginal cost curve. Because if the firm is ever finding it profitable to produce at one point, they will always find it profitable to pr produce one more. So the firm will, if it produces at all, will always ride through the downward sloping part. And the question is, how far up the upward sloping part they'll go. So the only relevant question is on the upward sloping part. It's a good, very important point. Thanks. Okay, um, 
no okay. At another price, you'd have the uh, higher quantity, or at um, four million consumed, produced, the marginal cost is two dollars. So that's what I've already said. The um, profits of the firm can be shown on this graph, at least their operating profits. We call it the producer surplus. You could also call it the operating profits of the firm. Okay? I want to convince you that this area below the price and above the marginal cost curve is the profits that the firm makes independent of its fixed cost of operation. The first unit, it has to pay this amount to produce it. It sells it for that amount, and so the difference is the price. The second unit, it, has, it pays this amount to produce it. That's what it gets as its price. And you just sum that all up, and this is what you get as the total profit the firm makes from producing those units. So the um, producer surplus is the area above the marginal cost and um, below price. The only caveat on this is that often, usually, it costs money for the firm to set up business before they can even produce the first unit. Um, so this, and this doesn't, this graph, since it's all marginal, doesn't account for those costs. It doesn't show them. So the profits of the firm, the total profits of the firm, is actually this area minus whatever costs there were to set up the operation. Now that doesn't really matter to us much in our, most of our analyses, because usually we're only looking at changes in profit, in which case the fixed costs are there no matter what. The change in profit for the firm, if the price goes down from P1 to P2, this is their profit before the price change. It's this area minus fixed cost. This is the profit at the lower price, so they're getting less profit minus fixed cost. The difference is the loss to the firm in operating profits, or in total profits, actually. Notice that the fixed cost is here, it's subtracted off originally, and it's subtracted off at the new price, and so it, it nets out, it doesn't matter. So the fact that this area here is operating profits, and yet this difference is the change in total profits, I think those statements are consistent with each other. Yeah. Oh, that's a five, that's supposed to be an S. Thank you. That's a, a typo, God knows how it got there. So marginal cost is equal to the supply curve. Now, one thing you should be asking yourself, it's nice to have this symmetry. We've got uh, the demand curve is marginal willingness to pay, supply curve is marginal cost, you've got the area under the demand curve, above price is consumer surplus, area above marginal cost, below price, is the operating profits of the firm. There's one seeming lack of, of, of um, symmetry on these two sides. Notice that the producer surplus is this area here minus the fixed cost. Whereas when we were talking about consumer surplus, we didn't have anything like that. We didn't have a, a area under the demand curve plus or minus something. In reality, we do. And I simply neglected to say it because it's a confusion that is totally irrelevant, but I like it for the purpose of symmetry. The area under the supply curve, under the demand curve, tells you the benefits you receive from this good. You add that up over all goods that the person's consuming, that's their total benefits, but we get happiness just from being alive, independent of consumption, and that's some amount, that's a fixed amount. And so in a sense, your, your consumer surplus is the area under the demand curve plus some unknown constant, in the same way that this is the profits of the firm or the area above the marginal cost curve minus some constant. So it actually is totally symmetric. Yeah? Huh? Uh, it could be. It's, it's irrelevant. Yeah. If you don't consume anything, you're really unhappy. Yeah. 
not clear how to even interpret that constant, but from a mathematical perspective, it's there. It's a constant of integration. Now, I want to use these things. I always like to, you know, show you how to look at things and then show you why it matters or an example of how it matters. What I want to show you now is using these tools that we've described, I'm going to show a very fundamental um, uh, result. Namely, that taxes necessarily hurt society. The tax revenue that the government gains, which is the gain from the tax, is necessarily less than the loss to consumers and producers from the tax. This is a startling and fundamental issue. Consumers and producers lose more from the placing on of a tax than the government gains in revenue. This is like a prima facie case that you shouldn't do taxes unless you have a good, really good reason, and we'll discuss those reasons later. But the first step is to recognize placing a tax on a market necessarily hurts the economy as a whole in terms of the, uh, the um, benefits being less than the cost. How do we show this? With our graphs, it's exceedingly easy at this point. You should be able to do it yourself. You can probably already guess. Suppose we have a market without a tax that has an equilibrium P1, and we place an excise tax, and the price goes to P2. I'm not going to draw the extra supply curve just because I don't want too much going on on this graph. The new price is up here at P2. Okay? What is the gain to the government? What does the government get as revenue? The government gets as revenue the level of the tax times the quantity that's being sold at the new price after the tax has been levied. Okay? So here's the quantity that was being sold originally. After the tax is placed, the supply curve shifts up by the full amount of the tax. You get a new equilibrium at a new price with a smaller quantity that's being produced. The government gets this difference. This is the amount of the tax. That's the amount that the supply curve shifts up. You can imagine a new supply curve going through here. That's the amount of the tax per unit times whatever units are being sold at this new price. So it's this big rectangle there. That's the gain. That's the gain to the government in terms of extra revenue that they get and get to spend. Now the parties that lose from this are the consumers and the producers. How much do the consumers lose? The consumers lose the area to the left of the demand curve between the two prices, the original price and the new price. It's that purple area, as I've shown. And consumer and producers lose the area to the left of the supply curve between the original price, P1, and the new price that the, cons that the supplier is now receiving. This is the new price that is in the market you take the tax out of it because the government gets some. This is the price that the firm receives. So from the firm's perspective, they've had a diminution in price from here to here. This dif difference in price is the supplier's burden of the tax. And this area right here, the kind of buff area, is their loss in monetary terms. If you put them all together, that's the total loss, consumers and producers combined, Compare that with a gain to the government. This is the total loss here. This is the gain to the government. And as you can see, the total loss exceeds the gain to the government. Hang on, I know it's getting uh, close to the hour, but I want to finish this. This area right here is the amount by which the loss to consumers and producers exceeds the gain to the government. That's called, just by tradition, deadweight loss. It's, I don't know where that term ever came up, but it's important to recognize that it's a loss, again, that is not ever transacted. It's not money that changes hands in any way. Hang on. What happens is, since consumption moves back from where it was, consumers lose by consuming less of the good, 
They are now not getting the benefits of the, of the units that they would have consumed otherwise. And producers are losing because they're selling less of the good and not making profit on those goods they could have sold at the original price. So both of those parties are losing relative to what could have been. And that's the amount that the revenue is less than the pain of the tax. Hang on, one last question for you. Then why do we tax? Well, the answer is, if the tax revenue were going to be used only to provide one dollar of benefit for each dollar of tax revenue, the government's gonna spend it to do something with it. If there was only one dollar of benefit obtained from every dollar of tax revenue that was spent, then you would never want to place a tax. However, the government should be spending its money in the same way that firms do. Spending the money in a way that provides more benefit, more than a dollar's worth of benefit, for a dollar's worth of expenditure. Education is a great example. There is far more benefit from a dollar spent on education than the dollar. So if you can prove that the tax you're planning to levy, the revenues from it, are going to be spent in a way that generates enough extra benefit, that's outside of this graph, how the government's gonna spend the money to overcompensate for this, then the tax is a good idea. But if you think the government's only gonna get one dollar of benefit from one dollar of tax, or maybe if you think they're even gonna get less, you should be opposed to any tax, okay? Thank you. See you next time.